We've been studying the book of Joel for a long time. And I want to thank you for being willing to study the book of Joel for such a long time. And I hope that it's been good. Today is the 18th Sunday that we've been talking about. I think we started like in November, which was a little while ago. But it's been really good for me to spend so much time studying one book of the Bible. I told you right at the start that one reason I wanted to do this is because my father, who's a pastor and professor, wrote a commentary on the book of Joel. And I brought it just so you can see what it looks like. So this is what it looks like. And so, it's a big book. And so what this Bible study has allowed me to do is actually read through the whole book, which is what I wanted to do. And there's a lot of information there, and I tried to share a lot of that with you. And today is the last, the last class. So after Easter, we'll move on to something else. But I'm thankful we've had the chance to spend so much time. I don't on your sheet today have any review questions. But I felt bad about that, because I know how much you like to review things. And so, just to start, we're not even on the sheet. Can you just tell me what the main theme of the book of Joel is? Good, you said some good things. Someone said sin and grace. Someone said repentance and good. And what's the, the background of the book? What's happening? Yeah. There's, a, there's a calamity. There's this disaster, a locust plague. Okay, and so from now on, when you think of the book of Joel, and it's just this little book in the Old Testament, but you can remember some of these things. The book of Joel is about how believers in God face a big calamity. And you face it, not in really a surprising way, but by repenting of your sins and by looking to God for deliverance and salvation really what the book is about, which makes it a little bit like a summary of the whole Bible. Because the whole Bible is about God's people facing a big calamity. What's the big calamity that God's people face? Sin and death and hell and judgment. And so all of life is God's people are facing a big calamity and what do we do? Repent. And we look to God for salvation. Okay, and so in a small way, this little book, talking about a specific challenge God people faced, it really is kind of like the whole Bible in a nutshell. Of we're constantly facing disasters of all kinds. The root of all of them is sin and evil. And the response we give is always to repent of our sins and to look to God for salvation and trust that He's going to deliver us. You think you can remember that? About the book of Joel? God's word for a time of calamity or disaster. The one thing that's left for us today is that the book of Joel is filled with beautiful promises. And we've studied all of them. But one thing that makes it hard, and this is true for much of the Old Testament, is that those beautiful promises don't sound like promises we like to hear today. Right? The book of Joel doesn't say Believe in Jesus as your Savior, and you'll have eternal life. It doesn't use those exact words. Alright? And so it gives promises, but the promises are in language that we're not used to hearing. And so what we're going to talk about today is the beautiful gospel promises of Joel, why they sound different to our ears today, and how it's best for us to understand them, so that we realize that Joel and the rest of the Old Testament is meant for us today too. Follow that? So, we're going to start with this. These prophecies in the Old Testament that are really meant to be good things are called restoration prophecies. Right? They're the gospel of the Old Testament. And so all the prophets of the Old Testament include, include prophecies of good things for God's people in the future. These prophecies are often called restoration prophecies. Have you ever heard that phrase before? No. Restoration prophecies? So here's an example from the book of Joel. Joel chapter 3 verse 1 says, In those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. So in that verse, what's God promising to do? Restore. So if God's making a promise to restore, what type of a promise is that? Restoration. A restoration prophecy. Okay, you following this? 
Right? And this isn't unique to the book of Joel. Okay, if you read the prophets in the Bible, you know much of the Old Testament are prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, all of these books, much of, of their, the, the, the good things that they say is written in language like this. God will say, I will restore the fortunes of Jerusalem and Judah. Okay? Kevin, think that you've heard stuff like this before? Okay, this is what we're going to talk about today. What, what does this mean? So Bible scholars, as they study the Old Testament, have noticed 13 main components of this promised restoration for God's people. So the big picture is God's telling his people, I'm going to restore you. And hopefully that sounds good. It's a good thing. I'm going to restore you. As people study the Old Testament, they say, you know, there's kind of like 13 big categories of ways that God does this. How does God bless his people? How does God restore his people? Here's 13 categories. One of them is rain. We'll, we'll get to that. Okay, and so what I have on your sheet is a list of 13 things. I'll put them up here on the screen too. We're going to go through it one by one. We'll just talk about what do you think this means. Okay, when we get through all 13, we're going to go back and we're going to think which ones of these show up in the book of Joel. Not all 13 of them do. But some of them do. And if you've been coming, I think you'll be able to point out, yeah, we heard about this and we heard about this. Okay, so here's 13 ways that God promises blessing to his people. The first one is he promises return to the land. Now, I started by saying that sometimes what makes this difficult is this doesn't really speak to us today. So if I say to you that God is so good, he's going to return you to your land. And what do you think? <laughs> Kind of like, like, what? It doesn't, that doesn't resonate with me, right? All right, so let's think, why is this a good thing? When God would say to his people in the Old Testament, I'm going to be so good to you, you're going to return to your land. Why would that have sounded good to them? Excellent. I heard a bunch of different things, but they were split apart. They were in exile. In captivity. Not the whole time. Sometimes they were in Judah and Israel. But the Old Testament, the message of the prophets is, you have sinned and you're going to be taken into captivity. And God would promise, but I'll return you to your land. Right? If you were like a prisoner of war in Vietnam or Korea or imagine a place today, and somebody came to you and said, sometime soon, I'm going to let you return to Oklahoma. How would that feel? Wonderful. Wonderful. It would be awesome. Okay? So, sometimes when you read the Old Testament, you'll hear this. God says, I'm going to, I'm going to be good to you. I'm going to return you to your land. And it's like this. It's almost like I'm in captivity. I'm a prisoner of war. And God's saying, you're going to get to go home. You think, that sounds good. All right, the second one, the cities are going to be repopulated. What city especially do you think is going to be repopulated? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And so you'll, you'll hear this again and again as you read the Old Testament prophets. Well, one day, Jerusalem will be full of people again. One day in Jerusalem, there will be old people and young people at the same time. The old people will rest on their canes and they'll watch the young people playing in the streets. And again, you think, that isn't ex what I expect the Bible to say. <clears throat> Why would that be such a beautiful thing for God's people to hear? Because they were deported. They were deported. And what happened to their city when they're taken into captivity? Destroyed. Completely destroyed. Completely destroyed. You know, today when we hear about a war, there's, there's at least concern about there's going to be civilian casualties. And we don't want to, you know, we want the armies to fight. We don't want innocent people to get hurt. And did they consider that in the old days when you were fighting a war? 
No, the goal was civilian casualties. The goal was to destroy everything as much as you possibly could. And so when Jerusalem was conquered by the Babylonians, what happened to Jerusalem? It's just completely destroyed. Right? Like flattened. The whole city. And so God tells his people, one day, there's going to be people in Jerusalem again. And not just like some old survivors. There's going to be kids in Jerusalem. It's going to be full. It's actually going to overflow the walls of the city. You see how that would be a good promise? Okay, so again, this is God promising good things. It's just not in our language today. Right? I've gotten to go to Jerusalem, and what's interesting, if you go to Jerusalem, even today, you know, you're walking around these what seem like old city streets, and then you get to a place that's really historic, like the church over where Jesus was crucified, or where the temple used to be, do you know what you have to do? You have to go down a bunch of steps. And it's kind of strange. Like I'm walking in this really old street, and then you get to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and you have to go down a whole bunch of steps, and then there's the church at the bottom. Why is it like that? Because the city of Jerusalem, even since the time of Jesus, has been destroyed so many times. And it's made out of rocks. So what do you do? Flatten it out. You build on top. Then you flatten it out. And you build on top. So the streets of Jerusalem today are tens of feet above where they used to be. And I forget. I think Jerusalem's been leveled like 23 times in its history. I mean, so many times. And, and this promise, it's going to be a city again. It's going to be people there again. Right? This is good news. Third one, there's going to be peace and security. Maybe we can relate to that one. Okay, what was God promising? No more. No more. All these enemies that are constantly around you and fighting you, someday you're not going to worry about that. It's not going to be any more. Right? Sometimes the way the Old Testament talks about that is by saying one day you won't have a wall around your city. Because every city had to have a wall, right? And you just think, we live in a city that has no wall. Right? People in the Bible time, they could never have imagined that. You have so much peace that you don't need a wall around your city to protect you from people invading? Like, this was unimaginable. Okay, and so God would promise peace and security. Number four. God would promise that the foreigners would be conquered and included in God's people. Why would that sound like such a good thing? Same, same, this, this idea, no longer be enemies. Okay, and just notice that there's a second part to it that even these foreigners are going to be included in God's people. Why would that have sounded really surprising? They were the Gentiles, and who did the other foreign nations worship? False gods, idols, and God promised one day, not only are these other nations not going to attack you, but many of those people are going to actually want to worship the true God. And I bet God's people, when they read that, they're like, no, that's never going to happen. Right? But this is, this is God's good promise. Even your enemies, one day they won't be your enemies, and Many of them, they're going to worship God with you. Right, this is good news. Five, prosperity of every sort. Right? Uh, Self-explanatory. But there's all sorts of different ways the Bible talks about prosperity. But God's going to bless you. Number six, a messianic king. Who's that talking about? Jesus. Jesus. Okay, today's Palm Sunday. Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. There's an Old Testament prophet who prophesied that Jesus would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. Do you know which prophet? Not Isaiah. That's always a safe guess. Start with Isaiah. Because that's not Isaiah. Zechariah. Zechariah. And he doesn't use the name Jesus, of course. He uses the word king. One day, 
A king is going to come to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on the colt the full of a donkey, and he is going to bring you victory. That's what Zechariah wrote. Who's he talking about? Jesus. Jesus. But this is part of these restoration prophecies, right? Israel's government was often a mess. They had a lot of kings who didn't believe in God. Then they were going to be conquered by their enemies. They were going to have no king, no government at all. One day you're going to have the best king. And he's going to really rule you and save you. It's going to be good. All right? Verse 13. We've got a long ways to go. Number seven. The forgiveness of sins. And so part of these prophecies was always included... God's going to forgive your sins. Why would that need to be a part of it? What's at the root of every calamity and disaster and destruction in the world? Sin. So God's going to restore you. It's forgiveness of sins. And, you know, we're, we're so used to thinking about Jesus dying on the cross, which is great, but the Old Testament prophets are filled with promises of God's forgiveness. And have you heard the one about though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow? Right? That comes from Isaiah. You heard about yeah. your sins are going to be hurled into the depths of the sea. Right? That's from the Old Testament. Yeah. Let's see. Right? As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. It's from the Old Testament. Okay, so we've got promises of forgiveness. Number eight, God says one day there's going to be wholehearted devotion to the Lord. Right? Why would that have been such a good thing? Because there was so much sin and idolatry and turning people away from God. And remember the prophet Elijah? He, he fights against the prophets of Baal and Mount Carmel. He doesn't actually fight. They have hard altars and God sends down fire from heaven and, and he thinks that he's won this big victory and then Queen Jezebel says, I'm going to kill you tomorrow. And Elijah runs off and do you remember what Elijah complains to God? I am the only one left. Elijah looked around and I cannot see a single other believer in God. And sometimes God's people felt like that. God's promise is one day you're going to see a whole bunch of people fully devoted to the Lord. That'd be good news. Number nine, a, a new temple. Excellent. Ultimately, our temple is Jesus. Okay? If we hold that thought for a second, why did they need a new temple in the first place? This guy's destroyed. The Babylonians, just, they're going to destroy the temple. Okay, remember, they only had one. Right? If a Christian church today gets hit by a tornado, it's, it's a traumatic thing, but there's 100,000 other Christian churches that we, it's okay. Right? But that temple in Jerusalem, how many of the temple were there? One, that temple's gone. Now, now it's gone. And there's going to be a new temple. Okay, ultimately, that temple is Jesus. Do you remember what Jesus said to claim himself as the temple? Jesus was once standing in the temple and he said to the Pharisees and the teachers, he said, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it again in three days. And they said, it's taken, I forget the number, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. How are we going to build it in three days? But what was he talking about? <laughs> Himself. And if, if a temple is where God meets with us, where is it today that God meets with us? What did you just say the temple was, Karen? Jesus. Jesus said Jesus. Jesus is where God meets with us. It's not some physical place. We don't have to go to this one building and there we'll find God. Wherever we're in the presence of Jesus, we're in God's temple. Excellent. This is his promise. I'm going to provide a, a place where you can be with me. All right, number 10, remarkable changes in nature. 
So like in the book of Joel, we hear about this, this, this locust plague, right? And everything's famine and destroyed. And what was God's promise? I'm going to rain and the fig trees are going to bud and grapes are going to grow. And, okay, this is it's a restoration prophecy. There's going to be things that happen in nature. If you look at this word remarkable, can you think of something in the book of Joel that would actually have been truly remarkable? There are a couple of phrases that we talked about. Or you've been coming. Something was going to flow from the hills. Milk is going to flow from the hills. Okay, that would be a pretty remarkable thing, wouldn't it? Okay? So there's going to be these big changes in nature. And again, today, we, when we think about spiritual things, we don't, we don't often think about nature. Right? But this is how God would talk. All right, I'm going to bless you so much. Nature itself is going to flourish. Number 11, God is going to live with his people. Okay. When the Israelites got taken into captivity, how did they feel their relationship with God was? Broken. Broken. Separated. And so God makes this promise. I'm going to live with my people. I'm going to be right there with you and dwell with you. Twelve is joy. So even these Old Testament prophets, which sometimes are known for judgment, often bring up joy. One day, you're going to have joy. One day, you're never going to cry again. One day, you're going to have this joy that never goes away. And finally, no end to God's blessings. And so, if you read through the Old Testament, you'll have this phrase, forever. Forever. It's going to happen forever. They're not going to fight forever. There's going to be no tears forever. You're going to have this feast set before you forever. It's not going to end. Heaven? Just ultimately makes us think about heaven. Yeah, good. All right, I'm guessing if you studied the Old Testament, you could, you could make as many categories as you wanted to of these things. But this is what... Bible scholars will say, here's, here's at least 13 different general categories of God makes all these promises. We can categorize them like this. These 13 things. Any questions on those things so far we've gone through? All right, now here's, here's the, the tough part. Okay, this is our last day in the book of Joel, so I should have a big test. We shouldn't even be talking. I should have a big test for you to fill out. But here's a little bit of a test, okay, from the, the times that you've been here talking about Joel. Of these 13 things, which ones have we heard something about in the book of Joel? So, forgiveness of sins. So there's just a focus on repentance. And of course, repentance is always, God is gracious and compassionate and he forgives. That was in the middle of chapter 2. Good. That's in Joel. Prosperity. So prosperity of every kind. Where was that? Number 5. Prosperity of every sort. And that was especially when the book turns in the middle of chapter 2. Right? They repent. God forgives them. And then God says, I'm just going to, I'm going to bless the land. Right? Crops are going to grow. There's going to be rain. There's going to be food. It's just going to be, it's going to be prosperous again. Good, all right, there's two of them. Wholehearted devotion to the Lord. Good, wholehearted devotion to the Lord. Okay, you just hear this in Joel. Who, who was supposed to repent? Everybody. Everybody. Everybody's going to get together at the temple. Everybody is. When, when God pours out His Holy Spirit, who's He going to pour out His Holy Spirit on? Everybody. Everybody, right? Men and women, sons and daughters, young and old. It's not just going to be like two people following God someday. It's going to be a whole bunch of people. Good. It's three of them. No ending to God's blessings? No ending to God's blessings. It's good. Okay, and so behind many of the promises in Joel, there's this idea it's not, it's not going to happen again. Right? God's going to win this victory. And then it's never going to get bad again. Good. Remarkable changes, in Remarkable changes in nature. We mentioned the milk flowing from the hills. 
Okay, Joel mentions that there's going to be a house of the Lord, and from that house of the Lord is going to be a spring that turns into a river and flows a great distance. And do you know how many big rivers flow through Jerusalem and go a big distance? Zero. Zero. There's no big river in Jerusalem at all. So that would take a remarkable change in it. God's talking in picture language, but remarkable changes in nature are part of Joel's prophecy. Yeah, foreigners conquer and included in God's people. Right. So remember, there was even a verse that talked about in the new Jerusalem there won't be any foreigners there. And we said, of course, this isn't a, it's not a racist or nationalistic comment. What it's saying is nobody who doesn't believe in God is going to be there. They're either going to be conquered or they're going to be part of God's people. You're doing great. Um, God living with his people. Excellent. Last. God living with his people. So... The Lord's going to be a refuge to his people. The Lord is going to dwell in Jerusalem. Right, this is all part of Joel's prophecies. Joy. Joel mentions the word joy. Good. I think the one that we haven't mentioned would be cities repopulated. So Joel talks about Jerusalem being blessed. And Jerusalem is going to be a prosperous city again. But the point is, Joel doesn't have every one of these 13 things in it. But just in this little book, we've seen these beautiful pictures that they're not in our language of today. God's telling his people, I'm going to bless you in this way, in this way, in this way. Okay. Any questions about that so far? Okay, we've seen these things as you read the Old Testament. Don't be surprised when these things come up. All right, so what does it mean? The best way to understand these restoration prophecies is to look at God's blessings to his people in three eras of history. I've even got a timeline for you today. Okay? Some of you have been asking for timelines. Not out loud, but in your head so I can hear you asking for timelines. Okay? When you hear these restoration prophecies, we can think of them being fulfilled in three ways and in a bigger way each time. So first, some of these prophecies do get fulfilled for God's people in the Old Testament. They get to return to Jerusalem. They build a new temple. God watches over them in a miraculous way. After the drought and famine of the book of Joel, it rains again, and there's seasons. And crops grow. Okay, God certainly forgave their sins. God lived with his people. And so, when we hear these prophecies, the first thing we think of is, a lot of these things, God did for his people Israel. We even hear about it in the Old Testament. Does that make sense? So some of the promises were fulfilled pretty quickly in the people of Israel. Some of them weren't. You know, like... Having joy that never goes away? Was life always great for the Israelites? No. no. The wholehearted devotion to the Lord? Did they all follow the Lord all the time from then on? No. Okay, but some of them are fulfilled for Judah. The second era, or the second fulfillment, would be in the Christian church. And so you think about God promises, I'm going to give you a joy that's never going to go away. Where ultimately does that come from? It comes from Jesus. God promised, I'm going to give you this messianic king who's going to rule you forever. Ultimately, when did that happen? When Jesus came. Okay? And so in an even bigger way, God's promises are fulfilled in the Christian church. Do, do Christians have the forgiveness of sins? Yes. Do, do Christians have God living with them? Yes. Do Christians have the blessing of promises without end? Yes. I'm trying to think of other ones on my list. Do Christians have a temple? Yes. Yes, yes Jesus, right? We talked about that. All right. 
Uh, so these, these promises were fulfilled some ways for the Old Testament people and lots of ways for Christians today. But I think even as Christians today, we'd say, well, it doesn't quite feel good enough yet. Right? We still have heartache and sadness. And certainly not, we don't see a wholehearted devotion to the Lord. Not in us, not in others. And, and so ultimately, where are these perfectly going to be fulfilled? In heaven, in the New Jerusalem. Right? That's what the Bible calls heaven is the New Jerusalem. And so when you get to the end of the Bible, like Revelation, and you hear about what heaven's like, it sounds like the Garden of Eden, only way better. So nature's going to be perfect and abundant, and there's going to be rivers and streams and trees and fruit, and God is going to be there. And there's going to be no wall, and there's going to be no sun, because God is the light. And ultimately, these promises get fulfilled in, in heaven. Does this make sense? So you read the Old Testament, you get these promises that oh, God's promising to restore his people. What's this talking about? Well, well, some of it's going to happen right away for his people. A lot of it is God's talking about what it's going to be like to be a Christian when you believe in Jesus. And ultimately, this is what we're going to find in, in heaven. Okay, now of those three eras, the greatest fulfillment of these prophecies will be in yeah. heaven. Okay, and so whenever we say, well, it seems like it could still be better, the answer would be, duh. Yes, it can. And that's because we're not in heaven yet. Any questions about that so far? All right, of what, everything I just said, <clears throat> The trickiest part is, how do we know these prophecies are actually meant for Christians? Because Jesus said the Good. So how do we know these prophecies find fulfillment in the Christian church? Because the Bible says so. Only because the Bible says so. Okay? So, here's three examples. If you flip to the third page of your sheet. Here's a prophecy. It's a restoration prophecy. This one's from the book of Joel. This one we should be familiar with because we talk a lot about it. And afterward I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Joel 2 verse 28. Okay, this would be in that cat. This is a restoration prophecy. God's promising to restore his people in a big way. Blessing them with the Holy Spirit. Right? And we say... This prophecy is fulfilled in the Christian church. God pours out His Holy Spirit on Christians. How can we say that? Because that's what the Bible says. So in Acts chapter 2 on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes on Jesus' disciples, they get up and they start speaking in tongues and proclaiming God's word and Peter gets up and he says, these people are not drunk, as you suppose, it's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. So how do we know that Joel was talking about the Christian church? Peter tells us so. Peter tells us so. Okay, so Jesus' disciples, they recognize these promises... They were true for God's people in the Old Testament, but they're even more true for Christians. Follow that? So the fulfillment of the prophecy was God pouring out his voice with Pentecost. And how does that continue? Who has the Holy Spirit? Gentiles. Gentiles, I guess. Anybody who has been baptized and believes in Jesus. Right? God's fulfilling His promise. Here's another prophecy. This one's also from Joel. It says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Joel 2.32 
Now, we might read that one and we might think, that doesn't seem to be talking to me. Because what places does it mention? Mount Zion, Mount Zion and Jerusalem. Are, are we in Jerusalem? No. Are we on Mount Zion? Which is the hill of Jerusalem? No. And so you might just read that and you think, well, that's talking to some people over there long ago. Okay? But actually, it's used in the New Testament. Right? Here's Romans chapter 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, everyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What verse is Paul quoting here at the end? Joel. This one, right? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Whom does Joel say this promise applies to? Everyone. Everyone. Including whom? Jews and Gentiles. Everyone who calls... And but whose name do they call him? If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is the Lord, Paul says, you know what Joel is talking about? Everyone who calls on the name of Jesus, whether Jew or Je whoever you are, if you call on the name of Jesus, what's going to happen? You'll be saved. You'll be saved. So this restoration prophecy that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, where do we see that fulfilled? In Jesus. When? No. In the last 2,000 years from, from when Jesus was on earth, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And you see it happening in Oklahoma, and in Africa, and in Asia, and everywhere. Okay, this restoration prophecy... It mentions Jerusalem and Mount Zion, but those are just terms for God's people. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Are you following this? Right? Here's one more. Here's something that happens in Amos. Amos is another prophet. Amos chapter 9 says, In that day I will restore David's fallen shelter. I will repair its broken walls and restore its ru ruins. What word is being repeated? Restore. What kind of a prophecy is this? Restoration. A restoration prophecy. So I will repair its broken walls and restore its ruins, and I will re rebuild it as it used to be, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, and will do these things. And I, you're honest. You read that and you think, I don't think that has anything to do with me. Right? Restore David's fallen shelter? Rebuild some city? Okay, it seems like it's talking about the Jewish people and rebuilding Jerusalem and they're going to be stronger than Edom. Right? Isn't that restoring our hearts in, in, in Jesus and, and repenting? And yeah. Look at, look at how this is used in Acts chapter 15 in the New Testament. There's a big conference, a big church conference, a meeting about what about these Gentiles? Can they be part of the Christian church? And they have a big discussion and here's how it ends. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this. As it is written, after this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord who does these things, things known from long ago. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. So 
This is, this is one that I don't think we would have figured out on our own. Amos has this prophecy. God says, I'm going to rebuild David's fallen tent. I'm going to rebuild David's fallen city. Exactly. James, who's the brother of Jesus, he's the leader of the church at Jerusalem, by the Holy Spirit, he says, what Amos is talking about is bringing all sorts of people together into what? And the one faith into the Christian church. And so these words about rebuilding the ruins and the walls, it's not talking about a physical city, it's talking about people, a church. Right? So this prophecy to restore David's fallen tent is God says, one day I'm going to rebuild the people of God. I'm going to build up the Christian church, and who's going to be a part of it? Lots of people, even the Gentiles, are going to be a part of it. It doesn't matter, Jew or Gentile. What this prophecy is talking about is people coming together through faith in Jesus to build the Christian church. And again, I think we'd admit, you know, without the New Testament helping us, I don't know that we make that connection, but this restoration prophecy, it's fulfilled in, in the Christian church. Understand that? Here's why this is important. So when I read that God will shower future blessings on Judah or Jerusalem or Israel, I know that God is promising future blessings for for me or for all believers or for God's people. And this can sometimes be a hang-up in the Bible because we'll see words like Israel, Judah, Jerusalem, Zion, and you know, we think, well, I'm not in Israel or part of Jerusalem or Judah or I don't even know what Zion is. And the truth is, when these are promises of God for the future, it's God promising to bless his people. And who are God's people? Everyone. Not everyone. Oh, oh, everyone who believes in Jesus. Everyone who believes in Jesus. Okay, you follow this? Sometimes in church, when we have our confession of sins, sometimes we use the words of Psalm 130. That's the one where it says, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my cry. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? Does this ring a bell, though? In you there is forgiveness. And then it ends with, Wait for the Lord, more than watchmen. Wait for the Lord, more than watchmen. Wait. And the final verse is, Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love. He will redeem his people from all their sins. But that verse starts with Israel. And every time I read it, there's like this catch in my mind of, oh, it's talking about Israel. Who is it talking about? All believers in God. Old Testament, that was Israel. Today it's all Christians, wherever we're at. So you, Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, he will redeem his people from all their sins. Do you see what this means? Okay, it means the Bible applies to, to you. So why does it just say that? Why does the Old Testament use Old Testament terms to talk about New Testament blessings? Because it's the Old Testament. And do we sometimes have this expectation? Like, why doesn't the Old Testament tell us about Jesus and the twelve disciples and how Jesus died on the cross? And why doesn't it do that? First of all, it actually does. There's all sorts of amazing prophecies about those things. But if they don't use those exact words, why is it? It hasn't happened yet. Right? Why didn't people in the 1800s write much about cell phones or cars? Why didn't they? They must have been pretty stupid back then, right? Why didn't they write about those things? Because they weren't there yet. They weren't stupid, right? They were probably a lot smarter than us for what they were able to do and to survive, but of course they couldn't write about something that, that hadn't happened yet. Okay? So in the Old Testament, we shouldn't expect it to speak like the New Testament. 
Because it's not the New Testament, it's the Old Testament. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. And so to his people in the Old Testament, if God wanted to say, I love you, what would he say? I'm going to return you to your land. I'm going to rebuild your city. I'm going to let your fig trees grow. I'm going to send a king who's going to deliver you. I'm going to dwell among you. You're going to have joy. That's how God would say it. Because when the people heard that, what do they know? God loves me. Okay, does this make sense? Don't let, don't, don't make, make the Old Testament talk like the New Testament. Appreciate God's blessings set and His promises. Right? So if the, the restoration promises of the Old Testament are meant for God's people of all ages, that means they're meant for for me, and here's just a couple examples from Joel. Never again will my people be put to shame. That applies to me. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That applies to me. The Lord will be a refuge for his people. That applies to me. Okay? So in the Bible, it's not like, you know, there's part of the Bible that's for me. And then there's a part of the Bible that's for people long ago. And this is not true. Okay, the Bible is written for God's people. And if you're the people of God by faith in Jesus, then the Bible's message is written for you. Does this make sense? All right. Now we have to talk about something sad. <clears throat> so, there are a whole bunch of Christians who would disagree with everything we just said. And the reason that they would disagree with all of it is because of the, the, the false teaching of the millennium. You heard of the millennium? Yes. Millennialism? All right? Instead of seeing fulfillment of these restoration prophecies in the Christian church in heaven, as the New Testament does, many evangelical teachers say that Old Testament prophecies will be fulfilled literally on earth in a thousand year millennium before Judgment Day. So there are a lot of Christians today who say, you know this prophecy about Jerusalem being rebuilt, or this prophecy about milk flowing from the hills. That's not talking about the Christian church. That's not even talking about heaven. That's talking about what God is going to do in the land of Israel in the millennium. Some aspects of millennialism. I bet some of you heard a lot about this. I bet some of you don't know a lot about this. Millennialism is based on a literal interpretation of Revelation chapter 20. Millennialists teach that Jesus will reign for 1,000 years on earth before Judgment Day. Okay, we could have a whole Bible study just on that one sentence. Okay, but we did. When we went through the book of Revelation on Wednesday nights, we talked about Revelation chapter 20. If you have interest in it, go back on our YouTube page and find that Bible study. There is one place in the Bible that mentions a thousand years. Just one place. It's Revelation chapter 20. And it's very clear from Revelation that God is using figurative language. Because the whole section is all figurative language. People who believe in the millennium say, nope, God's not using figurative language here. There's going to be an exactly 1,000 year period where Jesus reigns on earth. Old Testament prophecies will be fulfilled literally on earth during the millennium. All of these prophecies that we just talked about and said these apply to Christians, these Christians would say no. All of these prophecies are talking about the millennium. When the millennium comes, that's when these things are going to happen. Old Testament restoration prophecies are not referring to Christians or the Christian church. Instead, they're referring to the literal nation of Israel, past, present, and future. 
So we just had the verse, never again will my people be put to shame. If you were talking with a millennialist, that millennialist would say, don't you dare apply that verse to you. It's not talking about you. It's talking about Israel. Right? The Lord will be a refuge for his people. That's not talking about you. That's talking about Israel. It's in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ will rule on earth for 1,000 years in a kingdom of peace and prosperity that will include abundant rainfall, miraculous fertility, health, no war, and perfect relationships. And so Jesus is going to come back and reign on earth for 1,000 years. And when Jesus is here, then all of those restoration prophecies, that's when they're going to happen, when Jesus is on earth. Okay, are you at least following what they're saying? So if you put it in a timeline, it would be like this. There's these prophecies in the Old Testament. They are not referring to Judah, the Old Testament. They're absolutely not referring to Christians. They're not referring to heaven. They're referring to the millennium. These are promises that are going to be fulfilled during the 1,000 year period of millennium. Not for God's people long ago, not for us today, not in heaven. They're for the millennium. Okay? Follow? This is what, this is what they're saying. Okay? If Jesus came today for his 1,000 year millennium, I would tell that people who believe that, how am I going to live another 1,000 years? Why am I going to... Why is he going to be here and I'm not going to... And do I get to go visit him when I can't afford to go there? you got a lot of good questions, Terry. So th th there's a lot that goes into this. First of all, together with the millennium is the rapture. Yeah. And so actually, if you're a believer in Jesus, you won't be here for the millennium. You're going to be raptured. And so Jesus, when he comes back, believers are going to be raptured before that happens, usually. Yeah. That's usually what people say. So there's all sorts of things that go into this. Okay, but you're asking good questions about am I going to live on earth the whole 1,000 years while I actually see Jesus if he's in Jerusalem and I'm in Oklahoma? And lots of questions we can ask about this, okay? But this, this, is, this is the plan. Okay, you follow what they're saying? This is basically that whole left behind thing. Exactly. So have you heard of the left behind books, which are, other than the Bible, like the most popular Christian books? are the left behind books, that's all full-blown millennialism. All right? The Bible itself is not focused on the Christian church. It is not focused on heaven. It's focused on this 1,000-year reign of Jesus on earth. This is what we need to put our focus on. And hopefully you're thinking that's different than what the Bible says. And that's different than what we believe. Because that's all talking about signs and, and things happening that were prophesied, but not this, it's taking it out of context. <coughs> yeah, it's like they're on a big roll now because there's going to be that solar eclipse and they're calling it biblical. And yeah. They're on a big tear about that. Right? So, <laughs> just be aware. Exactly. Just be aware that this is a, a very dominant part of American Christianity. And probably the, the Christians who are considered most conservative in the United States, many of them are millennials. And so I'm not saying that everything that they say about the Bible is false. But this belief about millennialism, it kind of, it shadows over everything that they teach. Okay? And it's just something to really be aware of. Here's just some more charts. So according to biblical teaching, which we believe would also be Lutheran teaching, but biblical teaching, Jesus came, these are the last days, right? Ever since Jesus was on earth, we're in the last days, right? There's going to be this big battle. We heard about that in Joel, right? What's the fancy name for the big battle? Armageddon. Okay, it's going to happen right before Judgment Day. There isn't actually, whoops, there isn't actually a battle. What happens? It's already won and Jesus comes back and judges. And so we've got Jesus came. Jesus said, I'm going to come back anytime, right? 
This whole period of the New Testament, we're waiting for Jesus to come back. We're in the last days. Ultimately, there's going to be this great climax. There's going to be nations gathered together against the Lord, and Jesus is going to come back, and either you go to heaven or hell. Does this sound familiar? Yes. Okay, this is what we believe. This is what our church teaches. So, millennialism would be different. Okay? They would say, we're not in the last days. We're not. Because the millennium hasn't happened yet. Okay? There's going to be this big Armageddon that's actually not before Judgment Day. That's before the millennium. So nations will gather together against God and then Jesus will come back. He's going to reign on earth a thousand years. Then there's going to be another rebellion, this time of the devil, and then it's going to be Judgment Day. Okay, and what's not on this timeline would be the rapture and the tribulation and there's other aspects to all of this. And, okay, can you, can you just see the difference? Okay, Terry? What if, uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, let's say this is true. Mm-hmm. And the believers are raptured out. Mm-hmm. Then there are believers sitting here in the United States of America and say, oh, Jesus is over there in Jerusalem, I hear. Uh, should we believe on him now, or what? Is this to bring more people to faith? Excellent. Yeah, you're thinking like a you're thinking like a good millennialist, Terry. Yeah. You are. So this, if believers are raptured to heaven, Jesus comes back and reigns on earth. Of course, the unbelievers, some of them, are going to recognize that Jesus is the same, yeah. and they're going to believe him. That's a good thought, right? Yeah. Okay. So again, these people aren't bad people. It's just what they're teaching is not what the Bible says. And what you just said, and what they teach, what does that say about unbelievers in relation to Jesus coming back? They have time to get right. They have a second chance. Yes. And which, again, they'll get a second chance to exactly. their eternity. Okay, and so, if, if you're an unbeliever today, you know, the worst that could happen is that you miss out on the rapture, but then you're here for the millennium, and you'll get to believe in Jesus anyways. You get a second chance. And again, this this doesn't sound bad, and there's a good desire behind it, right? What's the problem? You don't get right. It's not what the Bible says. That's the problem. And what does Jesus say? When is the day to be ready? No, he's going to come like a thief in the night. Okay, and the thief doesn't come one night and say, I'm coming back tomorrow. So be ready tomorrow, and then I'll come. No, it's we need to be ready right now. This is your last chance. This is your, this is your one and only chance. This is our time of grace. This is our, our time to believe in Jesus. What would be differences then that you notice? Well, why is he fighting Satan again? Yeah. Why is he fighting Satan again? So, all right, here's, here's the long answer. You were here for some of those Bible studies on Revelation. Okay. Revelation has cycles of seven things happening. Seven things, we start over seven things. Follow, follow this, okay? When we studied Revelation, we said, clearly the best way to understand this is that each cycle of seven refers to the same thing. So here's one sevenfold description of what's going to happen. Now we go back to the start. Here's another one. Remember what the other option would be? That they're all in the line. And each of those sevens ends with a big destruction. Uh, See what I'm saying? And so millennialists, they're going to say, well, we're going to take these literally as there's 21 things that are happening. Not seven things, 21 things. The problem with that is, at the end of each one, the six and seven involve a huge battle. And so, oh, I guess there's not just one. There's got to be at least three of these things. Follow that? Yeah. And so Armageddon is at the end of Revelation 16, and then we have another seven. And then we get to Revelation 20, and now the devil's defeated. And we would say, clearly, we're getting different pictures of the same same events. Okay, millennialists say, nope, we need to have multiple, multiple big battles, multiple rebellions. All right, what, what differences do you notice? We talked about Jesus is coming. That's fine. It's not 
So, Jesus coming again with millennialism isn't final, not the first time. There's multiple comings of Jesus in millennialism. Okay, and now just think of what you know about Jesus talking about the end. Does he talk about coming back multiple times? No. Never. The Son of Man is going to come and he's going to separate the sheep from the goats and that's it. Okay, other differences you notice? What's it? Armageddon. So there's this difference of how, you know Armageddon and these different rebellions and how many how many big cataclysms are gonna are gonna be. Okay, and Jesus says there's just there's all these signs working up to the great last day. In millennialism, you've got you've got this huge timeline of various things that all have to happen at different times. According to biblical teaching, when could judgment day be? Anytime. According to millennialism, when could judgment day be? <coughs> Not for a long time. I suppose the millennium could start any time. The rapture could be any day. But judgment day, nope, we gotta that's it's a long way off. Okay, according to the Bible, God's promises of blessing and his calls to repentance, who do those apply to? Everyone. Everyone. Okay, according to millennialism, who does that apply to? The people of Israel. The people of Israel. Okay, now we could go on, but can you see why there'd be lots of American Christians who support the nation of Israel? And there's all these politics put into it, and it's all wrapped together that somehow we have to have a nation of Israel for the Bible to be fulfilled. And that nation of Israel, we should probably be friends with them because look at what's going to happen in that nation. And, and you can sit back and just say, I don't have to worry about this. Okay? This isn't what the Bible's talking about. I don't have to worry about this. Alright? Here's just some problems of millennial. We pointed some of these out. When God speaks symbolically in the Bible, He wants us to interpret His message symbolically. Okay? When God speaks in symbols, we should understand Him as speaking... Uh, let's start over. We should understand Him as speaking... In symbols. Okay, and this is where you can you can go round and around with somebody about this. Okay? Should we take the Bible literally? Yes. 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 But what does that mean? It means when God speaks literally, we should take him Seriously. literally. When God speaks figuratively, we should take him figuratively. Do you see what that means? To take someone literally means that you understand what they're saying, and you take them at their word. Okay, if I say, it's raining cats and dogs. How should you take that? You should take that symbolically. Figurative, because what do I mean when I say it? Figuratively symbolic, I mean the same thing. I mean it's raining really hard. Okay, what if he said, oh man, I, you know what, I respect Pastor Nate. If he said it's raining cats and dogs, it is raining cats and dogs. I'm going to call my family and tell them that in Bixby, Oklahoma, it's raining cats and dogs. And would that be the right thing for you to do? Sure. <laughs> that would be wrong. You wouldn't be understanding me, right? So when God speaks symbolically, we, we understand it symbolically. Millennialism focuses on future earthly blessings and ignores heaven. Especially heaven. This is a sad thing. The Bible focuses our eyes on heaven. Millennialists focus our eyes on the millennium. And the millennium is not a true thing. Even if it were, how long does the millennium last? A thousand years. How long does heaven last? Why would we want to fix our eyes on something that even, even the millennium, as millennials describe, it doesn't last forever? Well, we should focus our eyes on, on heaven, on what really lasts forever. Millennialism misses the truth that the Christian church is the new Israel and robs Christians of the, the comfort of God's word. Okay, you are Israel. The promises of God for Israel, 
They're for you. Right? Because Israel is the people of the promise. It's those who believe in God's promise of a Savior through Jesus. Right? Does this help? Okay. Let's end just by reading the last verses of Joel. And these verses are total restoration prophecy. It's a great example of what we're talking about. But as we read them, I want you to, to think, this, this is talking about me, about God's people. Then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Jerusalem will be holy, never again will foreigners invade her. In that day the mountains will drip new wine and the hills will flow with milk. All the ravines of Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of Acacias. But Israel, Egypt will be desolate, even a desert waste, because of violence done to the people of Judah, in whose land they shed innocent blood. Judah will be inhabited forever in Jerusalem through all generations. Shall I leave their innocent blood unavenged? I will not. The Lord dwells in Zion. Now a millennialist reads those verses, and what do they think? <coughs> We really need to protect Jerusalem because look at it's right there in Zion that's in Jerusalem. Okay, and boy, it's going to be good. One day, somehow, there's going to be milk flowing down the hills. Boy, one day, I hope I see that in the millennium. Okay, mountains dripping with new wine. Uh, we'll see. That'll happen in the millennium. But as a Christian reading those verses, what do you hear God saying? He's saying, I dwell in you. Isn't that cool? He's saying, I'm going to pour out blessings on you like you can't believe. Right? Here on earth, but forever in heaven, it's going to be beyond your wildest imagination. Water. Oh, isn't it great to have water? And wine and milk. Everywhere and enemies, you don't have to worry about your enemies. Right? No matter how much violence they've done, you don't have to worry. God is going to take care of his enemies. Whatever innocent blood has been shed, God, God knows. The Lord dwells in you and okay, how how are you supposed to feel when you get done reading the book of Joel? Happy. Happy. Yes. Joy, like ah. This sounds good. Right? Do you see that? These are God's promises. The Bible is filled with so much comfort. And to understand it, we have to understand this idea that God's prophecies are talking about His people. His people are those who believe in Jesus. And you can read the Old Testament and you can understand it. And it gives you comfort. It applies to you. I didn't leave any time for questions. We're done. Right? Next Sunday, we'll have Easter breakfast at this time, so come for breakfast. And we'll start a new Bible study the week after Easter. Let's say a prayer. Dear Lord God, it's a bit been a blessing for us to spend so much time studying this book of Joel. It reminds us that every part of your word is special. Every part of your word is written for us. Help us never to stop growing in our knowledge of you and your word. Lord, we especially talked about your promises today. Help us to believe that these promises are true for us. You are with us. You forgive us. You sent your King Jesus to be our Savior. No matter what part of the Bible we read, the Old Testament or the New Testament, help us to see your grace to us in Jesus. To him be the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.